Crescent is dojo it was a historical landmark in my opinion. It was it, it was an institution because of all the good things that have come out of that dojo that have benefited the community. I mean, you know, you look at it and it's it, it's really old school. You know, it used to be a house and it was converted into a dojo. I mean, it's it's been around for over four decades and when I heard that it was going away because of eminent domain, uh, it upset me. Like a lot of, it upset a lot of people. And I know that Sensei tried to fight it, but at the end of the day, he was unsuccessful. I started karate when I was about seven years old, almost eight. I had a friend named Joe who uh, very excitedly told me about how he just got enrolled in his karate class and uh, he basically recruited me. So I went down to meet the instructor. His name was Glenn Robago and uh, he put me, got me a gi and that's how I got started. And my mom started taking me to these lessons. Eventually, Glenn left and his brother, Sensei Richard Robago, took over the dojo. And that's who trained me for um, many, many years. I actually got my black belt under Sensei Richard Robago and also under his Sensei, Master Tadashi Amashita. And uh, most of my training for these past 43 years has been in Shorun Karate. My encounters with Sensei Demura were through the magazines and the books that my mom bought me to keep me motivated. So we would go to the store and I would see a magazine and it would probably have Sensei Demura on the covers because he's been on so many covers of Black Belt Magazine and Inside Kung Fu and Karate Illustrated and Official Karate and all those other magazines. And my mom would just you know, buy me any karate magazine because she knew that it was good for me. Of course, I had his books. There was, you know, the, the book on the nunchaku and the book on the sai. He wrote one on the kama, the tonfa, and also on shitoru karate. So I had all these books. Uh, we had heard that Sensei Demura was throwing a tournament, as he does every year. And so my mom took me down there, and I competed in the kata division. And, of course, I did not place, but I still felt pretty good about being there because, wow, there's Sensei Demura and, you know, this is the guy that's on the, you know. And I had I had his books and I was a little bit hesitant to want to approach him. I was kind of, you know, kind of shy. I didn't know if he was going to, you know, be open to it, but he was so nice. He was so friendly, took pictures with me and happy to sign all my books and even gave me some pointers. Not only did I become a lifelong fan after that, but I felt like we that was the beginning of, as they say in Casablanca, the beginning of a beautiful friendship. And uh, we kept in touch over the years. He always called me. So uh, even though he wasn't my sensei, he was still, um, I consider him one of my senseis. You know, he was very, very much like a, a father figure to me as he, he is to many people throughout the world. Hi, good morning, sensei. How are you today? 
Oh, fine, thank you. Good, good. And thank you for so much for opening up your dojo to us and uh, allowing us to uh, take a closer look at uh, the Shituru Genbukai Karate Dojo. Oh, thank you. Uh, you opened this dojo in 1965, is that what? Well, you... just, just praise is 68. 68. But uh, before other praise, 65. But the first time I opened, he opened the dojo was 1958. They moved around two times, then 17th Street. Mm -hmm. Then I came over 1965. Mm -hmm. Then three years later, we had so many people, so we had to buy this place. So we, I think we moved 68. This place have uh, uh, so many people visiting here. Steve McQueen, mm -hmm. Bruce Lee, Jack Norris, Richard Robago. Mm -hmm. So many people stopped by. The dojo is so famous in this city of Santa Ana that somebody can probably just write Karate Dojo Santa Ana and you'll probably get the letter. Oh yeah, <laughs> definitely. No, no numbers, you don't need it. That's really cool. It's, it's better than writing to Santa Claus at the North Pole. Yeah. Right? <laughs> when you initially pull up to the dojo, the first thing you notice is, oh, it looks kind of small. And you might get lucky to get a parking spot. But every time I went, I always had a spot. And when you walk in, you see it's kind of disorganized. There's you know, some of Sensei's papers there. You see pictures of him from various magazine covers uh, and pictured with celebrities and other martial artists, you know, and it's like, wow, it's pretty cool. You walk down this little hallway and you go into change and the changing room is just like this room in the back that's got brooms here and a mop there. <laughs> I mean, just really old school. You go to the bathroom and it's like, you know, I think they, they had like a little latch that you, 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 you close the door with. And I mean, it's like, wow, this is really like, like an old building, you know. The mats are... Uh, it, it almost looked like um, it almost looked like there was like s fibers and straw coming out of some of the mats. You know, the mats are old. The walls, you know, are wood and paneling, and and there's just a feeling about it, you know. And it's it's it's, it's how much history, you know, is on these mats? How much DNA, right? How much? Um, blood, sweat, and tears, if I may use the cliche, to, you know, years and years and years of, of, of people training and giving it their all and, you know, all this, all this knowledge that has imparted, been, been imparted by Sensei, it, it, it's really, really hard to describe unless you've been in there, but there's definitely an energy and it's, it's very calming and at the same time, you, you, you can't duplicate that with a newer dojo. You just can't. There's just uh, there's there, there's something. You know, the dojo be itself almost becomes a, a living being. What about uh, Chuck Norris, how did you meet him again? Well, Chuck was a uh, uh, my other older dojo. Uh, he find uh, me, so he came over. He studied. He wanted to learn how to punch. So I started teaching him. So he won tournament. He got every tournament he won. He came to my tournament, UCI. First time I opened him up, he came over twice. He was pretty good. But uh, in the, then he started going in the movie business. But some people have a big head. But Chuck, doesn't matter where you go. He always nice to people. That's Chuck Norris. That's why he's success. You seem like you have um, opened your doors to karate people, regardless of style. Shotokan, Shoringu, Shitoryu, Gojuryu. Um, everybody seems very welcome. Yeah. Well, just like the United States. United States. Uh, not like Japan. Japan only Japanese people. 
but the United States ever mix. So basically same thing, martial arts, it's all the same. Style is just a little name. Big things, people forget it. So I just door to open to everybody. Dojo is a family, you know, you have to help each other. And something wrong, tell me that's wrong. Something good, you have to tell good. But this I know, bad part all the time, I'm thrown away. Good part, I want to keep it to the next generation. The mochi pounding is uh, something that I've come to really enjoy. Um, not just because the mochi is good, but because of how it's made, obviously. I love the fact that Sensei does that every year, and you know, he is carrying on an art that is also dying. It's a lot of fun, it's a good workout, but knowing that we are taking part in this tradition is, is a really cool thing. Rice pounding, that's the 500 years old that Japanese things. And there's a lot of work to do. I thought I'm gonna quit prison, but my students said no sense, they don't quit. I want to keep continue because Japanese people from Japan to come in, they never see rice pounding anymore because they have a machine. You put the rice and the water, push your button, end up made a machine and uh, mochi. But that's not the way it work. We have to be from a script, to make it to put the fire and uh, make it steam, then pounding, then make mochi. That's the 500 years ago, people did it. I still doing the same thing. And I think my American student can do without me. Japanese people don't know how to do it, but American people know. That's what I want to be. If you had um, one lesson that you could uh, teach your students and that you could tell them right now, you know, okay, I have one lesson and this is what I would like my students to remember me for or to remember in their lives. What would that be? Ah, uh, really I don't have any plan. But I always tell them, like a water, all your mind be like a water. Water, make dirty clothes, make clean. Water doesn't know what cup put me in. Square cup, round cup, any kind of cup. Water stay evenly fit. That kind of person I want to be. Doesn't matter where you go, people like you, people respect you, you have to negotiate it and help other people. It's, it's pretty dangerous nowadays in many, many different ways, but if there was one thing that you could share with the world, philosophy, uh, a technique, uh, a way of life, what do you think that would be? This, this would be Sensei Fumio Demura's one piece of wisdom. There you go, it's like a... Well, I think everybody should be smile. Hmm. Smile is very important your health-wise and uh, communication-wise. I usually call it each nichi each then. Then one day, one good thing a day, do it. If you 100 people there, 100 good things. Million people there, one million good things. Everybody, every day, one good things. If all the people come up, doors open, and the car come up, and you want to cut it, just let you go. Anything. Once a day, everybody do one good things. That's the day I 
tell the people. This was a much more e easy way of life. Mm. We had to go forward, not backward. Not just me, 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 me. You had to be other people too. In the last few weeks of Sensei's Dojo, what I saw from the students was great love, respect, and admiration for their sensei, but also a very, very deep appreciation for being where they were and who they were with. They were almost savoring being on this, on this dojo floor being taught by this man, being surrounded by these walls. It was, um, it's almost like they wanted time to stop. And don't let it end, you know? It's just very much in the moment. Um, everyone was just so appreciative, so in the moment, and just experiencing it capturing what it's like so they would never forget. Capturing, capturing what it was like to be in that dojo, training, giving her all for this man whom they loved and respected and admired so much. And knowing that this could be the last time. It's almost when you know someone is going to pass and every day you spend with them, you, you realize that this may be the last time. So there's a certain heightened, heightened reality, a heightened appreciation. You know, we tend to take things for granted on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, as we live our lives. But when you know <laughs> that the end is very near, you just tend to really, really focus on that. And that's the sense I got. That's the sense I got. It was, you could feel it. You know, I could feel it, you know. And walking into his dojo, you know, knowing that we were working on this project, I felt, I felt the same things, you know. I, I felt like, let me just, let me just savor this, you know. Let me, let me touch the floor, let me touch the wall. You know, let me just listen to Sensei as he is giving his commands or is imparting his knowledge, you know. You don't want it to end, you know. Um, yeah, that's what I felt. <laughs>